Become a Therapist podcast plus listeners can listen to episodes early and ad free right now. Become a plus listener by going to Apple Podcasts, searching for the Trauma Therapist podcast, and signing up today. Welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. My name is Guy McPherson. My mission is to help trauma therapists be their incredible selves, to be human, to be real, not just a clinician. I'm a big believer in who we are is more important than what we know. And this requires cultivating authenticity, genuineness, and vulnerability, and that requires intention. You can learn more about my courses and workshops by going to thetraumatherapistproject.com. That's thetraumatherapistproject.com. Let's get started. All right, here we go. So five, four, three, two, and one. All right, folks, welcome back to the podcast. I am very excited to have as my guest today, Dr. Galit Atlas. Galit, welcome. Hi. Hi, I'm so happy to be here, and um, thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. So Dr. Atlas is a psychoanalyst and clinical supervisor in private practice in Manhattan. She's a clinical assistant professor on the faculty of the New York University postdoc program in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis and faculty at the National Training Program and the four-year adult training program at the National Institute for Psychotherapies in New York City. As an essayist and author, Galit has published numerous articles and book chapters that focus primarily on gender and sexuality. She's the author of The Enigma of Desire, Sex, Longing, and Belonging in Psychoanalysis, and Dramatic Dialogues, co-authored with Lewis Aron, published by Rutledge. Galit is the editor and contributor to the upcoming book, When Minds Meet, the work of Lewis Aron. Her last book, Emotional Inheritance, a Therapist, Her Patients, and the Legacy of Trauma, is an international bestseller. It was translated into 23 languages and won the 2022 Godiva Award for Best Book that Advances Psychoanalysis. Not too shabby. <laughs> <laughs> too very, long. <laughs> very impressive, yeah. But welcome to the podcast. All right. So before we get going here, Glee, share with the listeners where you're from originally and where you are currently, and then we'll dive in. So I live in the last uh, 23 years in New York City. I teach at NYU. I'm originally from Tel Aviv, and uh, my parents came from Iran and Syria. Wow. So um, in in that way, a little bit international, but especially in the most uh, you know Middle East. Side awesome. Of the world. Awesome. So, how did this this interest start for you in in psychology and um, uh, and then broadly and then more specifically gender and sexuality? You know, I think that for me, like for many other therapists, becoming a therapist starts with be- being a patient. And as we discover that world of therapy, this uh, beautiful and and fascinating world of the mind. And so in my 20s, I, I was uh, I, I started my own psychoanalytic journey as a patient. And uh, then I started studying psychology. I did my uh, PhD and most of my writings were actually originally on sexuality. And I remember that originally people used to ask me that question, how do you, how did you start writing about sexuality? And even back then it was a little bit more embarrassing to admit that uh, research is a me search. <laughs> uh, and, right? I talk about it uh, in emotional inheritance when I talk about uh, how I came to the idea of talking about intergenerational trauma, talking about trauma and and about emotional inheritance. So my whole uh, journey as a clinician, as a, a writer on psychoanalysis, as, as, as a teacher, really was um, a research looking for answers. Well, what kind of answers? For what purpose? I think that originally, and I'll start with my writing on sexuality a little bit, uh, which would lead us to writing on trauma. And, you know, Freud said that there are two areas that there are, there is the most hypocrisy about, and it's uh, sex and money. I found that since I started writing about trauma, that 
trauma is one of those areas where people have a lot of secrets and a lot of shame. And we can talk about sh- the relation between between shame uh, and trauma. Mm-hmm. But for me, I think a lot of the things that I, I was looking into were shameful things. Uh, sex, sexuality. I, I came from a very, um, you know, my as I said before, my mother uh, was born and raised in Syria and my father in Iran and the immigration. And I, uh, one of the first articles I, I wrote years ago for clinicians uh, was uh, titled Sex in the Kitchen, talking about uh, all of uh, the sexual conversation in the female's kitchen and my and my family and all of the secrets around sexuality around the body and inhibitions so mm-hmm. I, a lot of my early interest was in family secrets and uh, in the last few years um i started writing about family secrets and about the secrets of inter- intergenerational trauma and our emotional inheritance. Wow, very interesting. So secrets, I mean, that, that can mean a lot of things, but secrets, secrets around sexuality and trauma specifically? I, I think that, interestingly, a lot of my book is uh, on sexuality and trauma, but the broad perspective is actually on the idea of emotional inheritance. And that is the idea that experiences, and especially raw and unprocessed ones, inevitably pass down from generation to generation. For example. Which means emotions, memories, feelings, traumatic experiences are transmitted from one generation to the next, which means that a lot of our parents and grandparents' experiences become our own emotional struggle, right? So, for example, there are many, many, many examples in emotional inheritance in the book. Each chapter is on a specific kind of angle on that topic. But, I mean, I'm, I talk about many, many kinds of trauma from, uh, you know, abuse, uh, attachment. So just give us, give us one example. I mean, one example, when I talk about, um, you know, the, the research on intergenerational trauma started with the Holocaust. So I opened the book with talking about research on the Holocaust and and uh, cases about how the trauma of the Holocaust lives in the mind of uh, the grandchildren, third generation. These days, we already have a third and fourth generation. Mm-hmm. And one example, for example, briefly, is that I had a patient, and I name him Benjamin in the book, who was claustrophobic. And only years later, we find out that his grandfather was actually buried alive. And of course, it brings us back into this mysterious question of how does that happen? Right. How does one generation live inside the other, which is a question we can talk about, of course. But in the book, I really talk about things that are more obvious or things that are more mysterious, how early loss uh, creates later issues for the next generations related to loss, uh, how, of course, how abuse emotional abuse, uh, physical abuse, and I have a certain a specific chapter on sexual abuse and the very specific phase of intergenerational transmission of sexual abuse. Mm. And so there are many, many uh, aspects of uh, our emotional inheritance. Some of them are more conscious and other are more unconscious. What I, I, I want to talk specifically about that intergenerational trauma transmission, but how did you become fascinated and interested in that specifically? You know, I felt that in my clinical work, when I say to the patient, there was always more than one generation in the room. Mm. I felt that I sit with the patient and when I I sit with their parents and grandparents, and something about that really fascinated me. Of course, my my research piece started with my own family trauma and and my own traumas that I talk about in the book very openly. So, because the book is divided to three parts of three generations, we all carry our parents' Uh, you know, traumas. But 
if we are parents, those of us who are parents also uh, transmit our own trauma. So I was interested in both. I was interested in my parents' trauma, and I, I talk about my parents' uh, immigration and racism, and both of my parents, interestingly, I found out only when I started writing the book that both my parents were very, very ill as, as uh, babies and almost died, and both of them lost a sibling, each of them mm. lost a sibling. And I have a whole chapter about loss of siblings and as an emotional inheritance. That comes from my own family trauma, right? And I'll tell you something interesting. I have I have a chapter in a book that is uh, describing a young woman who comes to therapy with me. And she walks in and she tells me that um, her brother, her older brother died a few years earlier. <laughs> And she tells me that, and I sit and I sit and listen to her, and I and I am very aware that this is. I write in the, in this chapter that it sounds like the most horrible trauma I ever heard in my whole life, and I sit there and I think to myself, I've never heard of something like that. This is so intense, and only after a while, I remember, so to speak, that actually my mother had lost her older brother. So I, in that chapter, I focus on that overlap mm -hmm. and the dissociation, my own dissociation that at the beginning, I don't I actually don't put it together until a little later in the treatment that I suddenly realize, oh, this patient is actually my own mother that I am treating, right? Wow. She has my mother's experience. And I really describe in details what it means when the when when a patient's trauma awakens our own ghosts, I call mm -hmm. that, you know, the ghost of, of the unsaid and the unspeakable. Wow. This book sounds fascinating. Um, let's discuss the, the transmission of intergeneration, intergenerational trauma. You know, you, you talked about that one example of um, the grandfather being buried alive mm -hmm. and the, the, this young guy being claustrophobic. How does that happen? We're talking cellular transmission here or what? Thank you for asking this. I think this is the most fascinating question of all. And there are obviously, because of that, there are a lot of debates about that, right? Nature, nurture. There are two main researches that are dealing with that. Of course, and I'm skipping the idea of in, of unconscious communication, which sounds too mysterious. Let's, let's go to... To research, okay. One of them is uh, the research of of uh, epigenetics on epigenetics. I don't know if you heard of that. Sure. Uh, yeah. yeah. For our Epigen listeners, yeah, give them the give them the thumbnail. You know what? I got to put on a sweater because I'm really cold. Oh, okay. Cold. Yeah. Excuse me one second here. Um, I hope it's not my the trauma that made you feel so so cold. No, it's it's the the snow. The snow. Where are you? I'm in Bend, Oregon. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So excuse me. So go ahead. So let's let's go back to. I'm talking about two kinds of research. Uh, that is actually. Um, it does not contradict each other. We think about both areas and how they impact each other. And so one body of research is the research of, on epigenetics, which is the biological mechanism by which trauma is transmitted from generation to generation. And the impact of the environment, especially trauma, when we talk about environment, we talk about psychological environment, on the expression of genes. So this is really the environmental memory, the, you know, and, and that uh, research talks about the memory of the genes and how they impact um, the expression, you know, of how trauma impacts the expression of genes. Uh, Rachel Yehuda from uh, uh, Mount Sinai has a whole body of research on mm -hmm. that. The other research that I'm talking about, which I'm, I write about much more in my book is attachment research, which I know you're very familiar with. Sure. And the idea that uh, children feel their parents from the moment they're born, they know them from inside. And, the, and all of that is related to contemporary infant research, 
I'm referencing in the book uh, Dr. Beatrice Riby from Columbia University, the research on parents and babies and how when you analyze moment by moment interaction, you realize that they respond to each other cues, to un unconscious cues. And to answer your, your original question about um, Benjamin and his family history, the assumption really is that there is something in the unconscious communication, something in the nonverbal communication between parents and children that especially young children and even babies pick up on. So, for example, like, let's make it really, really easy to think about. Uh, there is, let's say that this specific patient, there is a, you know, um, it's interesting because when I talk about my mother's history, I'm talking, my, my mother's brother drowned in the, in the sea when he was 14 oh, years old. Wow. It was never a secret in our family, but somehow the fear of water is transmitted from generation to generation. My children, who who obviously didn't know that person, I didn't know him, hardly heard the stories. They have their own legacy of talking about how, how people could actually drown in the ocean. How does that happen, right? And I think it's that is something that I assume I communicated with them without even being fully aware of it, because... Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, as a mother, I try not to scare my kids about, uh, uh, you know, about going to the beach. But the, it might be in my body language. It might be in, right, in everything I communicate with them mm -hmm. nonverbal. Wow. So in terms of trauma, in terms of treatment, what does this mean? What kind of information does this mean both for yourself as a therapist and for the client? I mean, that there's this intergenerational possibility here. I think what it means is that if we look at it from the intergenerational perspective, that there is something about understanding or, or making links. The work here is a work of making connections, of making links that will allow us to, um, to have more freedom in some ways, right? Because we are, we can actually work through whatever belongs to us and what belongs to our ancestors. Mm -hmm. If we carry with us, you know, it's interesting. I'll tell you a story about that. For example, I, I gave a talk not too long ago to a, a, a group of therapists. And at the beginning, I always ask people who has, who thinks they have intergenerational trauma? And usually half of the people raise their hands. And at the end, after we talk about all kinds of, I ask again, who has intergenerational trauma? And then, of course, there is no person in the world who doesn't have intergenerational trauma because there is no family without trauma. Every family has some history of trauma. And then one person, one woman raised her hand and she said, you know, only now I realized that in my previous career, I was a midwife. And as I listened to your talk, I suddenly made the connection, right? And we're talking about the work of making connection, the aha moment of saying, huh, suddenly I realized my grandmother died when she gave birth to my mother during childbirth. Mm -hmm. And I chose to become a midwife because all my life, I was aware that my grandmother died and my mother carried it. The trauma of losing her mother during birth. Oh my God. And, you know, and suddenly she, she realized what, what, what it was for her that she was trying to repair. Mm -hmm. Because what happens often in intergenerational trauma is that we try to repair what happens in the past? We try to not, right? We try to repair the people who were wounded. We try to repair the history. We try to, uh, and we try to heal our parents. I mean, you know, a lot of people claim that many of us therapists are in this profession because we try to, to heal our parents. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I want to touch, this is fascinating to me. Um, and it's just so interesting, Galit, to, to, learn about you and to learn how this topic has mm -hmm. come into your life and your work. Um, it, it, and it seems, you know, 
given your history and your background and where you're from, it it almost had to happen. It just feels very natural that this is the way um, you work and what you focus on. I, you mentioned shame and trauma. Let's talk about that. How do they interact? Why do they interact? You know, one of the most shameful things is being a victim. And I think that one of the reasons why people keep trauma as a secret is because they are ashamed of the position of being a victim. You know, I think there are other reasons and why, uh, that people keep uh, trauma as a secret, and some of them are related to the, the need to protect our psyche from being too overwhelmed by thinking about the trauma, and uh, right, especially if you're not in therapy. But I think that there is something about the shame of being a victim that is uh, is really one of the main reasons why people don't want to talk about it. It's too shameful. I th I'll, I'll add something else, you know. Uh, I think what we talk about survival guilt. And guilt and shame are cousins, as you know. And I think that sometimes related to the shame of being a victim, guilt becomes a, a defense mechanism, a, a, a strategy to avoid the shame of being a victim. And why? Because if I believe that it's my fault, it means that I believe that I could do something, right? Mm -hmm. That if I only, if I were only, right. I only did it, right? Yeah. And that protects me from the fragmentation, from the chaos, from the helplessness of being a victim, of being a helpless victim. And I can relate to that. Um, when I was younger, I was bullied. And when I was like uh, 11, 12, mm. and it really impacted the trajectory, negatively impacted the trajectory of my life, my self-esteem, mm. my how I showed up in relationships. And I have a lot of shame about admitting that that I was bullied by this person. It's crazy, you know, yeah. how this impacts us. You know how people blame themselves for for oh, being yeah. bullied? Why? Maybe I was weird. Maybe I was, uh, right? Weak. Weak. I was right. too... So I think it's so interesting that you're that you're mentioning bullying because that's a fascinating topic, especially around shame and guilt and how we blame ourselves or parents blame their children when their children are bullied and they say, maybe you did something, maybe. And why? Why is that? Why are you blaming your child? You're blaming right. your child. It is. You feel horribly helpless that you there is nothing you can do. And that mm -hmm. is the way you try to cope with that. It's interesting, and I don't know if, if you heard that, but there, were, there was a research that shows that therapists who were bullied ha are having a hard time. They have a hard time working with people who are bullied. Oh, yes. Tell I totally, that. when I was seeing clients, I totally did. I would get so activated. Activated, right. Oh, yeah. And I... I I would get triggered and I have to calm myself and like, this is not, I was I to say to myself yeah. right in the moment, this, what am I doing? This is not good. I, I'm like, I was like advocating for this client in a particular way. And yeah, it was like, oh no, yeah. Weird. And I think that's what it, it does because it, it really evokes a lot of helplessness and you want to, you want to tell the person what to do and you want to tell them, do this, do this, do this, because it's otherwise you have to sit with the vulnerability right. of being bullied. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's so painful. Yeah. So you, I mean, I was reading your bio and it's, it's. I mean, you're doing a lot of things here. You're also seeing clients and you're yes. teaching and you're right. How the heck are you doing all this? 
<laughs> so how, you've got like all these balls in the air. How are you seriously? I mean, you're, you're teaching. <laughs> you know what? I'll tell you the real secret. Yes. I don't do anything else but that. So I don't know. My kids make fun of me, and they're like, "You don't do. You don't do anything. You don't go to movies. You don't go to this. You always work, 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 work." So I think there is always a price, and uh, oh, once in a while I take a break. But um, yeah, it's 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 what I love. So the the last book, "Emotional Inheritance: A Therapist, Her Patients, and the Legacy of Trauma." The therapist is you. Yes, the therapist. Okay. Is- um, who's this book for? This book is for everyone. It's my previous books were for clinicians. This is my first book for, they call it for the public. Mm-hmm. And it was translated into 26 languages oh all around the world. And I, it's interesting. It's a fascinating journey for me to really see uh, the cultural piece also, which culture is more related to that, which culture likes it more, where it became a bestseller, where it didn't, like mm-hmm. when, all of that, uh, and, and the reactions of uh, different people to that. Uh, and my goal was really to take you with me into an emotional journey that will teach you something about yourself, right? And I, I talk a lot about myself in, in the book as the therapist as a human, as a right, a, a teacher, uh, as a mother, as a trauma survivor. Uh, but my goal is really to take you as the reader into your own emotional journey. When you first start, I mean, you have Galit this this uh, kind of amazing warmth and openness. Uh, uh, about you that I, I'm i sure translates into to the work you do with your clients. But when you first started seeing clients, was, was that there for you or was that something that you had to cultivate? You know, I, I don't believe that you could have a, you know, a fake persona is Not the fake persona, but there's an openness that you have. There's a uh, a willingness to uh, almost like a humanness to you that is very palpable, you know. And I think for a lot a lot of people, they need to get to a point where they're able to, you know, share that. Yeah. And for some of us, it's we need to hold that close closer to us, and we we maybe we learn to open up that. I'm curious about your journey. I think I had to learn at the beginning to hold it back, you know, because when you are in analytic, especially psychoanalysis and psychoanalytic training, you learn about neutrality, you learn about being a blank screen, right? You learn about uh, really holding back, no self-disclosure, which those are values that I still not only practice, also teach, you know, I don't go and, and, you know, and share with my patients uh, my life. And Well, that's, that's the extreme. Right. And being the blank slate is the other extreme. Where do you, and granted, everyone's different, all your clients are different, but where do you fall on that continuum? Do you self disclose when it's appropriate? It really depends. It really yeah. depends. I mean, my, my, where I stand theoretically is that the, my patients have the right not to know. Mm-hmm. And then I, I, that's where I start. Uh, and and from there it really depends. I think every every therapy is is a relationship. It's a real relationship, and I am a little different in each relationship. I'm not the same person, and yeah. so I feel like I meet we meet and we create something that is very unique uh, to the dyad, as we call it mm-hmm. in therapy, right? Well, awesome. All right. Uh, Galit. So the name of the book is Emotional Inheritance, A Therapist, Her Patients, and the Legacy of Trauma. We'll have this linked up at the show notes page here at uh, the traumatherapistpodcast.com. How can people get in touch with you, learn about you, find out what you're doing? I'm on Instagram and I post, uh, you know, my talks or news on Instagram. And also I have a website, uh, under my name, www.galitatlas.com. Okay. And that's where you can find me. Okay. We'll have those linked up here again. Galit, pleasure talking to you. Love to have you back. I literally. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's great, great meeting you and talking to you. 
Me too. All right. Take care. Bye.